it's time to put some balance back into your life in what was a very memorable night for French mixed martial arts fans. Not so much for Irish mixed martial fans, unfortunately, as Reese McKee and Caelan Lockram both dropped defeats at UFC Paris. In the main event, Sir Gan picked up a win over Sergei Spivak. Co-main event, Man on Furo kind of sealed the deal, perhaps, as the next number one contender at 125 pound division. As always, I am joined by the man himself, Mr. Harry Powell. He's going to be with me for the next couple of minutes, hours, probably an hour or so. And we're going to talk about this card. Harry, how are you, my friend? And as I do each and every time, I'll ask you to share your opinion and your thoughts on this card, please, sir. No problem. Um, first of all, the answer of how I am is, is tired, sir. Uh, this week, uh, the the gentleman that runs the 6.45 a.m. classes is away from the gym, and, and that means I've been given the opportunity to cover them, an opportunity I'm very grateful for, obviously. But uh, what it means is I'm up at 20 past five, and we're currently recording now at, at 32 minutes past 11 p.m. my time. And so, as you can probably hear, um, that's not a lot of time to do the sleeping and the things. So, you know, these things happen in MMA is the saying that, that we have. But in 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 this card, um, frankly, I thought it was great. Uh, we had, um, I'll just sort of very, very, very quickly run through. I mean, Garn, we'll talk about him, but I think there are still, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about him. I'll leave that, but that, that's a great performance. Rose Namajunas, so, so, so unfortunate to have the, the hand issue that she did. I think even with one hand, she she put on a very, very, very good performance in that co-main event. Benoit Saint-Denis, just absolutely fantastic performance. Volkan Ozdemir rolling back the clock and, and doing Volkan Ozdemir things. Very, very impressive. And then William gomez Gamori, we'll talk about that controversy. I think both you and I are on the same page there. Morgan Schrahier looked absolutely unbelievable. Disappointing for Kaelin Lochran and for, for Reese McKee. And then we roll into a horrendous fight be between uh, Connell and Edwards. And that was sandwiched by some some wonderful, wonderful grappling from the one Farid Basharat over a very dangerous opponent in Cledson Rodriguez. And then we opened the night with Fern and Cavalcanti who didn't know how to use their hands and, and solely use their feet. But sure, look, these things do happen in both curtain jerkers and in MMA. But overall, I think the French crowd really showed out. The atmosphere was fantastic from fight one all the way through. Fans were in their seats from fight one all the way through. And I was very, very, very impressed with, with the way that they both cheered on their, their hometown fighters, but also winners if, if the hometown fighters lost. I was very, very, very impressed at how invested they got into the Kalen Lochran stories. Obviously, they, you know, they booed him and maybe there was a, an incidental, coincidental mistake with the music being cut out or being played a little bit too late. But that, I think that made for an absolutely fantastic, mesmerizing sort of walkout that, that really brought that fight alive. I mean, it felt like a very, very big fight, a very big deal as Kalen Lochran walked out and you know, going in against Taylor Lapalus, we'll obviously speak about that in a little bit more detail, but we spoke about it on the preview show that he had an absolute set of stones on him, and, and I think he showed those stones in, in, in that fight. Both of them did, but um, overall, very, very, very impressive card. I, I really enjoyed it, Um, and yeah, you know, long may they continue. Yeah, that's it. Another, it, it was cool to hear the French crowd get so passionate and, you know, it, it kind of sparks the reminder of why we like these stadium shows, why, you know, we might complain a little bit about the Apex cards because, you know, the atmosphere and how the crowd get involved, especially on these, uh, the European events, perhaps, or maybe the international shows. And, and you know, we can get that somewhat as well, Harry, and the, on the US shows as well. But, you know, uh, we spoke about it time and time again, you know, the with the UK crowd, the French crowd with the Irish crowd they really like to kind of get in and they really like to kind of back their own as well but uh, uh, that's what they did in the main event um, Cyril Gann and Sergei Spivak uh, Gann went out one by TKO in the second round um, and the fight itself I mean we were asking tons and tons of questions for the longest time um, whether Cyril Gann has uh, upped his game in, in the kind of defensive grappling realm and you know he, he stuffed a couple of takedowns and stuff like that but it's not without a little bit of an asterisk behind, beside uh, Sergei Spivak's performance here in the main event I did not think he performed to, to his standards whether that was a 
a product of the way Cyril Gann fought, whether it was an injury, you know, I, I seen something popping out during there, there's been a lot of talk. Maybe perhaps he had a rib injury, no excuses, no nothing came up. Cyril Gann got the job done. He topped off a very memorable night for, for French MMA, but you know, I'm not that convinced with Cyril Gann. It wasn't a performance performance for me. It wasn't that Francis and Gano, uh, kind of, you know, sprawling against deep Miocic kind of level of, oh, but, you know, we did see Cyril kind of be explosive in, in kind of those takedown um, defense kind of repertoire. But, I mean, how did you, what did you feel? I, I'll, quit, I'll quit mumbling here, Harry. I'll just send it over to you. What did you think of uh, Cyril Gann's overall performance? I, I think I'm sort of with you, actually, but I, I don't detract anything from Sergei Spivak. I think Cyril Gagné took the fight away from Sergei Spivak from second one all the way through to the end. I I agree with the rib injury, although I only noticed it in the second round, and Cyril had been beating the body of Sergei Spivak pretty heavily. And so I'll have to go back and watch the fight again from moment one and see as the camera pans whether that that digit, if you will, is popping out from the left-hand side of, of Sergei Spivak's ribs. But I didn't notice it. In, in, in the first round. And generally, these are things that I'm looking for, right, as these shots are flying in. Um, but I thought that I didn't... That's harsh. I learned something about Cyril Gagné's takedown defense, right? And that was his immediate reaction hasn't changed. But when he settles and his brain settles into the idea that he's not going to get taken down... He's definitely been drilling some things. He's definitely been working on some things because there was a moment where he did sprawl. He got an underhook and then he covered the tricep of Sergei Spivak. And for, I don't know, a second or two seconds, spanned the corner and was in looking for a back body lock on, on Sergei Spivak against the cage. You don't do that unless you've been doing a bit of front headlock defense, single leg defense. So, you know, for Cyril, I think it's still very much a raw skill. It's still very much a work in progress. And I don't think we learn anything in terms of Sergei Spivak offensively bouncing and 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 bringing reactions out of Cyril Gagné and then dropping in on a really nice level change, pushing him up against the fence and actually working a sequence. Every takedown attempt that we saw from Sergei Spivak was one that was defensively minded, that was counter offensively minded rather than specifically offensively minded. I thought Cyril did an absolutely unbelievable job of just immediately forcing Sergei Spivak to be completely confused. It reminded me of, do you remember Psyduck, the Pokemon? Like it reminded me. Of, We're in yellow, but I'm not a big, big po Pokemon fan now. I have to enough. admit. So. One of his about, Pokemon about Pikachu, and that's about it. It was a little bit after my time. Grand. There was one of the moves called Confusion, right? And it basically left the op the opponent Pokemon just wandering around the, the gaff, not knowing what the fuck was going on. And that was Sergei Spivak. Like he was just following Garn the entire fight, basically. Garn's movement was too good. The head movement was too good. He would be throwing shots at a variety of impact levels so he'd start with a jab at 10 percent. he'd just touch him with an outside low kick just touch literally touch him five percent barely even whisked the outside thigh and then he'd crack him in the body and then he'd crack him up top and then he'd go back and he'd be dancing and he'd be moving his head and his feet are moving and the stances are switching and the hands are dropping and the levels are uh, the dropping and the feints are coming in and then he'll hit you hard with a jab and then just touch you lightly with the right hand. You just, Spivak did not know where to defend, when, where to put the eggs in, where the basket was going to land, how hard the shots were coming in. And it reduced him to two things. The first thing was, as soon as he had an opportunity, he just launched himself forward and tried to land haymakers. And against somebody of the footwork of Cyril Gunn and the head movement of Cyril Gunn, that's that's absolutely not going. It's to just not like re, uh, without trying to be too harsh, but it just wasn't good enough for a main event showing. Now we don't know if there was an injury or whatnot. It was is yet to be seen, I guess. But like from what I did see, it was a relatively disappointing for Sergei Spivak. Like half-heartedly went down for takedown defense. 
uh, no sign of urgencies. And as soon as his back was against the wall, it was like, you know, he wanted a way out of there. And I think Cyril kind of give, gave him a way out of there. Now, the, the circumstances, uh, it's not an easy kind of setting to go into. But, I mean, why don't you just go in there and do... Like, I mean, it's easy for me to say it's not as easy to, uh, for me to kind of do it. But, like, or as John Jones has done it either, is like, why don't you just go in there and desperately try and take this man down for every single second of this fight? And I didn't see that from him. It was like he tried once, he gave up, he kind of settled on the feet, tried half-heartedly again, gave up, kind of maybe had the injury then and he was kind of being a little bit more cagey and defensive. But I don't know, Harry. Like, I I was expecting a little bit more from Sergei Spivak. And, you know, I'm a little disappointed that I didn't get it. And I'll be interested to see if there is a big injury or something that did hold him back a little bit. But, you know, as a guy that we've been talking up in Sergei Spivak, so you can't say that I've been fucking, I've been too harsh on him here because I, I gave him his flowers earlier on. But this was his big moment. This was his big chance. And, and it really was a disaster for him overall. I just think that Cyril Garn's one of those guys that unless you're a John, T John Jones tier level fighter, you have to have the perfect game plan against. And it's very, very hard to do that. I, I think that when you get in there, the elusive level of his movement is staggering. I imagine that it's very hard to replicate his movement at 265 pounds. And I think it's incredibly difficult when you're actually in there with him and he's touching you and he's touching you and you don't know which one's going to land where, that you're, you're extremely defensively aware of just diving in on takedowns. Now, I agree with you. You know, Luke Thomas put up a stat before the fight saying that he um, he was very intrigued by Sergei Spivak in this fight because he has the uh, the highest palette of individual, like, different takedowns from lots and lots and lots of different positions in heavyweight MMA, right? And that tells you something. It tells you something that that he has pathways to mat returns from lots and lots of different places. But I do think in this specific fight, and I agree with you, we've talked him up a lot. I just think Cyril took it away from him because you can't you can't dive on takedowns willy nilly with a guy that can land knees and uppercuts and elbows and these sorts of things. And I agree. Like you could just go hell for leather and literally but try and run for his ankles. You, you can't. You can't. You can not. Not to say to dive on takedowns, but like surely based off what we've seen, mm. you would have expected to be seen a little bit better than what we've seen. Like not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not asking anybody to go and throw for for naked take. He kind of did. Kind of do that. It's, like throw, throw, go in for naked. Kind of not take double leg takedowns, but more so maybe the body locks, body lock takedown or something like that. But I don't know. I was just a little bit disappointed. And it's unfortunate for Cyril because, you know, a diminished performance like that from Sergei Spivak kind of takes away a little bit from his performance where we still kind of would maybe have a little bit of doubt of what way he would kind of counteract a heavy grappler, maybe, you know, at a higher level per se. Would would that be a fair thing to say? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it makes the Tom Aspinall fight even more intriguing now, it, right? It, oh God, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk about that. Just let no look. You've created a perfect segue. Let's do it. How do you see that fight going down? That is, that's a real good and interesting fight in my book, man. I think the intrigue for me is I'm way more in this specific fight. I'm way more on the side of yeah, okay, Spivak probably could have done more. Fine, but he's failed every elite test that he's come up against so far, right? Every fighter that we think is either destined or in the upper, upper, upper echelon of heavyweight MMA, he's failed against. And that's, there's no problem with that, right? Like that's absolutely fine. If that's, if that's the, the limit of your potential, that's the limit of your potential. And that you, you know, we need guys lower down in the roster to make a roster. And so I, I personally lean more credence into the Cyril Gagné performance than I do the Sergei Spivak detriment. The reason why I'm intrigued in this Tom Aspinall performance is Sihil is very fast. He's very agile, but so is Tom Aspinall. He's quick and he moves that 265 pound frame very, very, very quickly. Sihil is not 265. He comes in at whatever, like 238, 240, something like that. And he's not cutting weight for that, right? That's just what he walks around at. He just, you know, he strolls around, does a thing and then comes in and throws some gloves. Tom Aspinall is somebody that 
certainly trims a bit of fat, shall we say, over over the time, gets himself in a bit of a leaner shape, but moves very, very quickly and has a really dynamic striking game, not in the same vein as Sihil, but he has an ability to mix it up. He likes to go to the body, he likes to go to the legs, and he can grapple his fucking ass off. And so I think whilst I don't want to be in a position where you knock off two contenders that you know, you're potentially losing one fight for the belt, right? If if Sihil and Tom go at it, one of them's going to win and one of them's going to lose. And then you probably do the title fight after that. And then it, one or two fights later, those guys are going to be fighting again. And so whilst for the heavyweight division, as shallow as it is, I'm not sure I need to see it right now. But if they put it together right now, fucking A. I'd watch the oh, show. I think there's no other way. Why wouldn't they put something like that together right now? Well, because my my and don't get me wrong, like I'm down for it. I, I'm I'll sell me all the tickets. Yes. But if you if you do that fight, right? Let's say Cyril wins, right? Mm-hmm. Let's, let's just say Cyril wins. John John Stipe Miocic happens. It seems like both of them want to fucking retire after that, right? So then you you've got a vacant heavyweight title. You might just give it to Cyril, or you might then ask Cyril to fight the winner of say a. Taito Avasa versus a Volkov or whatever it is. How dare you forget about Sergei Pavlovich? Oh yeah, sorry, of course. So maybe you then do a Garn and Pavlovich, right, for the title. You, you, you could do like Pavlovich is the, is supposed to be the um, yeah, what the you alternate, call it? the alternate. Yeah, the alternate for um for that. Yeah. So you would imagine he might get a shoe in as the number one contender in that division where you may be... Uh, now, the only thing that I would love to see if if Aspinall and, and Cyril were to fight was that if the fight was over five rounds, I believe that's a five-round fight. If it even make, goes that far, I'd lo- I don't think it. that fight doesn't... A three-round fight doesn't do that fight justice, in my opinion. So that would be my... And they could. They could make it... They could make it... Like Aspinall said he wants to go again pretty soon in December or early next year as well. So, I mean, Cyril didn't take too much damage there. So you could be, you know, you never know what, like a big, big win uh, would could cement one of those guys a title shot or, or, or something better yet again after that. But uh, that is, that's up there for me right now, Harry, as, as one of the, my most highly anticipated fights in uh, the UFC full stop because it's kind of like this coming together of, two new age heavyweight fighters with athleticism and you know well-roundedness obviously just questions around Cyril's well-roundedness I don't think that we can question Tom Aspinall's well-roundedness all that much and I think tactically as well um it would be very interesting to see how they both match up um whether Tom will not want to stand and bang with him or whether he will kind of try to take him down and kind of short take advantages of some of the weaknesses that we've seen in the past from Cyril. But like, will it be a thing where Cyril might not want to take this fight soon? Maybe he'll want to go back to the gym. Maybe he'll want to work on that resting a little bit more because he's not silly. You know, he, he knows everybody else in the division has seen what happened when they, um, when, when he fought John Jones. So, uh, you know, it'd be a little bit foolhardy if he wasn't kind of going to try and mix it up and, and, and mix in the grappling. But, I yeah uh, I I love that fight. Look at I know you don't like doing predictions, and I know this is kind of out in the open. But if you were to pick somebody to win in that fight right now, who would it be? Tom Aspinall. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would agree with you for hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think Tom Aspinall is just too well rounded. I think that's what it just way more well rounded. Um, way more kind of adaptable to grappling uh, sequences I think and I think Tom would kind of fight smartly and and kind of put Cyril in in some awkward um, kind of positions and stuff like that you know so it'd be interesting to see how it goes any other final thoughts on this Harry before we move on I just think I'm really interested to see in a way I kind of hope that Stipe and John retire after this fight I'll, Mm -hmm. I'll explain why Because John isn't a guy that's going to fight three times a year, four times a year, five times a year. But it feels like Cyril and uh, Pavlovich and Aspinall want to be active. They want to fight. They want to be in and around each other for the foreseeable future. And so Stipe fights once every three years. If both of those guys move out, we're going to have such an interesting next two or three years with these three guys. You know, when Paul Hughes, you know, we have to mention Paul Hughes, right? So 
Well, he could, he could get the winner of this fight. Well, this is what I'm saying, right? If 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 Tom Aspinall doesn't get Sihil Gagne and they want to do a Pavlovich, we'll chuck Paul Hughes in there. Why not? Um, but I, I think that when we were so in love with the Cage Warriors 145 pound division recently, it's because we had Jordan Vucenic, Morgan Chachelier, and Paul Hughes. And there was this amazing little love triangle, the violence triangle, if you will, that was going on between them. They were rematching each other. You were fighting each other all the time because they were the three best guys in the division, right? Now, okay, we have Mr. Hardwick coming in now and, and, and you know, the, the, the pot is thickening, as they say. But there is no better time in a division when you have a multitude of guys that are at the absolute apex of that division. And it feels like we have Pavlovich, Sihil Gagne is all there or thereabouts, and Tom Aspinall is right there too. And Curtis Blades, obviously, for his for, for whatever, he's there too. And so there's a really, really interesting little four-piece or three-piece and a soda, if you will, um, hanging around the heavyweight division. And, and I, I really, really want to see that breath of fresh air. Yeah, I, I can't uh, disagree with that all that much either. And it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of months. Obviously, we do have Jones and, and Miocic coming up in, in November. But, you know, Cyril Gant, another win in the book, back in the win column. And he'll be glad to get that one uh, under his belt. And it'll be exciting to see. Hopefully, they do the right thing. I think they missed out a little bit. And uh, maybe the UFC kind of showed their hand a little bit and maybe not bringing Tom Aspinall into the cage or kind of maybe bigging that up. I think Cyril Gant, Missed a big opportunity to build up that fight uh, by, you know, not directly calling out Tom Aspinall as well. But that's that's his choosing. You know me. I just I want that. I want I want fighters to go out there and call their shots. And, you know, uh, that's how you create big fights here. And, and, and we need that to happen. And it'll be interesting to see what does happen. Um, what did happen in the co-main event was Manon Firo went out there and took out Rose Nama Yunus by unanimous decision. Um, I'm going to go straight to you, Harry, because you mentioned something maybe at the start of this podcast. You feel that Rose Nama Yunus and her injury cost her this fight here, which is a very fair statement. Um, the inability for her to throw her right hand left her without a repping, but you know, big up to, to Firo who stepped up and, and, and landed some big shots and took a very, very nasty cut that didn't, you know, seem to kind of change her mentality too, too much either. So um, overall thoughts on this is basically we kind of saw a, a little bit of a diluted fight maybe because of the injury of Rose Nami Yunus. I think Rose Nami Yunus wins this fight with two hands. Um, there were a, a number of moments where it was absolutely evident that the Rose Nami Yunus that had full functioning weapons would have looked to land three to five strikes in a combination, but pulled four strikes and just landed a single jab with that left hand. The right hand by midway through the first round was entirely limited to parrying and blocking head kicks. And on the one time she dropped Furo, uh, scrambling to a back body lock. And you could see that the inability for the right hand to grip cost her the body lock grip. And that is a crying shame because the first round was tough for Rose Namunas. Those even, even the first 30 seconds when her hand was fine, those first 30 seconds were tough. Manon Ferro did a great job of crowding, of using her size and physicality and, and the power difference, frankly, to just get in Rose's face and not allow Rose to build up a rhythm and get the beautiful movement working and get the angles working and get the head working and all this stuff. And she just clubbed her a bit, you know, just clubbed her around the cage a little while. And yeah. Rose then obviously hurt her hand. And you could, the, the I wrote it in my notes just here. I said that the there are two things that, that are really interesting to me. The first one is when she hurts her hand, Rose actually looks demonstrably better immediately because she has to laser focus in. Yeah, you're you're kind of like, oh shit, I'm hurt. I need to kind of turn it on here to try and get right. this person out of here because I may not be able to continue. Right. That's and it. so she she ups the level immediately. The angle changes are just sublime. Some of the head work is unbelievable. Now, okay, she can't throw the right hand and so then that leads me to my second point is that she just doesn't have enough power at 125. Mm -hmm. Like that was the big thing in round one for me. And also, Harry, with when you know you have an injured hand like that, like you said, you know grip strength. You cannot um, use it for grappling either. And you know we all get 
caught into the trap and it's like, oh, she hurt her hand and, you know, she can't throw the hand, which took away from her striking. But, you know, any t- any hand injury or finger injury is going to take away from your grappling as well. And I would imagine that Rose Nami Yunus would have felt that she was the more well-rounded of the two in there. And I felt that mm, I would have been curious to see if she would have kind of, uh, and she did kind of look to kind of initiate some of grappling exchanges as well. But obviously with the hurt finger and everything else going on, you, you lose that ability as do you kind of lose your ability to throw your, your strong hand and your inability to switch stances as well, you know, uh, with Rose Nami Yunus. It kind of took quite a bit away from her, that, that small injury. Right. But like, and I mean, what we don't know is whether the finger injury is a sort of ruptured anything in the hand. I mean, her manager came out and said that she broke her hand after the fight. So right. whether that's the, the finger has then done, you know, the bones have moved up and fractured a hand. We, we don't know, right? We don't, I don't think we know the extent of the injury just yet. But the thing that impressed me so much is how the second round was very close. And the third round on my scorecard and on two of the judges' scorecards was a Rose Namajunas round. So she takes a hard first round. She's figuring out the hand injury. She's figuring out a new set of range, a new set of positions, a new set of angles. And then the thing that was just so intelligent in round two, is she starts working the body, starts working the body, starts working the body, starts working the body, big shots upstairs, uses the right elbow instead of the right hand. And it's just a, a very mature adaptation from Rose Nami Yunus in round two. Now, the clash of heads happens. Very unfortunate. Extremely unfortunate. Because by the end of round three, uh, sorry, the beginning of round three, Manon Ferreira looks tired. And what I don't know is how much of that is just immediate blood loss because she was leaking. Oh, man, that's what I was going to say to you. Is like, you know, that a head clash like that is also a fight changer too. Um, and I think she did very well. And the cop man did an excellent job in, you know, trying to, to stop it. And, you know, we know how good cut men are in within the UFC and even they have struggled, but it's just trying to kind of just get it to close up as much as possible. But the place that it was in, we've seen something similar with Brad Katona in the Ultimate Fighter finale where he got cut right there, right where your temple is almost pumping at all stages when you're you're firing at all cylinders. But, you know, it, like you said, it's interesting to see if it did affect her. Uh, we, we don't really know, but it didn't detrimentally affect her really. Although she could have probably dropped her. I can't remember the scorecards now. Maybe yeah, yeah, 29, 28 on two cards. She dropped the third round because of that. And maybe that was a mixture of the cut. And maybe it was a mixture of, of Rose overcoming that mental hurdle of her finger as well at that stage. Um, You know, I think it was was a technical hurdle. Like I just think Rose realized, Oh fuck, I've got no hand and I'm going to need to change my game plan up. And the second round beating to the body. And this is what I don't know. Right. Was the beating to the body in the second round, the reason for the furrow sapping of the gas tank in the third round, or was it that she just lost so much blood and not only are you going to feel lightheaded and nauseous and a little bit tired from losing that amount of blood you also are going to have a mad adrenaline dump just a huge yeah. adrenaline dump when you're losing all that all, all that blood 100%. and so furrow looked tired she looked slow she looked sluggish in that third round and rose nami was was banging her up nicely nicely but then again as i stated at the start she drops her for a moment runs to her back grabs a back body lock and just can't grip she just can't grip. And so Faro just strips it immediately. And that's a real shame. Now, going into this fight, I said that I didn't really know what Rose Namajunas was fighting for. I didn't really know why we were up at 125. I didn't really like the idea of it. But she was quicker than Faro at all times. The head movement was just unbelievable. Her kicking game was still there. I would have loved to have seen, as you said, if the grappling was available with both hands. I'd have been very, very interested in in the results of those. And she is still an absolutely sublimely skilled fighter. I still think that at 125, the power discrepancy is going to cause her significant problems in the future. I really do. But man, sign me up to watch Rose Namajunas fight healthy with two hands any day you want. Because that woman is just slick as they come absolutely slick as they come 
absolutely beautiful to watch when she's in full flow and uh, you know it was unfortunate that uh, the injury happened and, and it kind of took away from the fight also maybe to go back to my point about Cyril and Tom being a five round fighter you know if we're talking about this being a, you know a possible number one contender up there I'd love to see these fights at five rounds as well and you know the way Rose came back into it too which is kind of unusual because we would have talked about Rose Namajunas kind of dying out of fights and she's actually building into a fight here in the third round so that just shows you the benefits of the move up just 10 pounds and rose namiuna's danger at flyweight and it'll be interesting to see i mean i've seen enough to want to see more from rose namiuna she showed me and she showed everybody else enough to to prove that you know her head and her body and her mind is still in this game and she still has a little bit of fire and hunger to kind of reach to the top of the mountain at 125 uh, it's a tough ask it's a, it's a tough ask but i definitely like to see it again Let's talk about what's next, though, Harry, before we quickly move on. Um, next for Rose, next for for um, next for Rose will be a little bit different than what's going to be next for Manon Firo, I feel. Um, Manon, does that kind of performance deserve a straight title shot next, or is she still kind of in the mix of this kind of merry-go-round between Aaron Blanchfield and obviously Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko, who are fighting next month? Um, for the flyweight title how do you kind of see the title picture shaping out first before we talk maybe about what's next for Rose I would like to see Manon Ferro versus Aaron Blanchfield next like it to like me it. so and and that fight is going to make itself as if Valentina Shevchenko goes out there and gets the job done on September 16th or in Vegas. And uh, yeah, I, I'd be all for that too. And if you are having a trilogy fight, well, you know, there's a, you put on Blanchfield and you put on Firo on the undercard of that. And let's see what happens for Rose Nami Yunus, Harry. What's next for her? What would you like to see happen? Uh, maybe a Tatiana Suarez. So I have two options. Um, the first one is Tatiana Suarez, and that's a uh, get a win there, and you're right back into the title, title picture. Or let's see a Macy Barber. Macy Barber just had surgery today, I've seen on her Instagram, so I think she's going to be out for a while. But if Rose Namajunas is willing to wait, Rose does not fight, you know, maybe that's a wake up was another thing. She doesn't fight all, all that often. So, you know, maybe she'll take some time off reassess things. Rose Namajunas herself has a hand injury. So maybe those kind of timelines will meet up. So it'll be interesting to see. I like that though, from giving Macy Barber a, an opportunity to come up there and, and she's definitely heading in that trajectory. And I ain't going to argue all of that at all. Um, and I ain't going to argue the fact that uh, Benoit Santini and Thiago Moises um, picked up the fight of the night uh, in, in, in Paris on Saturday. It was uh, promised by us as an absolute barn burner, Harry, and it turned out to be just that. Now, I know I kind of have a feeling that you might have a couple of thoughts here, and I maybe I'll try and encapsulate them here. Benoit then sent a knee, I think, just went out here and absolutely chose violence in the fact that he kind of threw all technique out the window to march forward and make this a war for the French fans. Um, and it was much to the dismay of his corner, really. And in between rounds one and rounds two, we saw the difference between the two. But you've got to respect Benoit Saint Denis for, for choosing to do that, um, coming through that as well, and then showing, you know, his level in round two where he went and got uh, Thiago Moises out of there by ground and pound. But boy, oh boy, uh, Benoit Saint-Denis was really playing with fire in, in the first round. He just was marching forward, Harry Landon, big shots and creating a ferocious mad pace in this fight. And, and the crowd and everybody else was lapping it up. Shawnee has spoken before about toughness being a weapon. The ability to take damage as being a weapon. Benoit Saint Denis, you don't get round two unless you had round one. In my yeah, opinion. yes. Right? In my opinion, round one broke Tiago Moises, not just physically with the big cut of his right eye and the elbow and the things and the dropping and the whatever, but it was Tiago Moises's inability to grapple offensively. He had a nice K-guard entry into like a half knee bar thing, whatever. That was never fucking happening. But his answer from the back body lock was to Granby. In modern MMA, 
Granby's don't exist. Like not from that position. Maybe they, maybe from a, a, a standing back body lock where you can literally launch yourself into a Granby and, and break the grips with it. Fine, possibly. But generally you just don't see them because guys are too good at following the hips and doing exactly what Abamo saint Denis did, which is just ending up in basically a close guard situation, landing shots on you. And, uh, Benoit Saint Denis went out and okay, he's not the most technical. I do like his level changes. I do like the timing on his level changes, and I do like the way he collects the legs, turns knees in, and and does a good job of collecting the mat return. But he goes out and he weaponizes one of his premier strengths, which is, is just his toughness. Right? Some of the shots that Thiago Moises landed in those cage exchanges on the on the fence exchanges. I am telling you, he finishes so many people in that division. It was crazy. It was like. When Benoit Saint Denis was kind of moving forward and, and and thrown in abundance against Moises, it kind of took Moises a little bit by surprise for a moment in time. And then it looked like I don't know what it looked like to you, but it looked like to me there was a moment in that first round where like Moises was covering up and then he just made the decision. He was like, Oh fuck it, I'm just gonna have to throw back here. And he like took a deep breath and just started firing off like like an insane man. And a lot of them did land, and Ben Moss and Denis ate up every single one of them. And I was also very impressed, Harry, um, about Ben Moss and Denis grappling in the first round as well in, in the mad kind of scrambles and the positional um, exchanges that he was winning there against a very astute Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I think he showed that he does have the ability to um, to hang with uh, high-level grapplers um, within the UFC. Obviously, Moises... There's going to be better grapplers than him that he probably will face off. But Moises has kind of, he's knocked guys out. He's submitted guys. He's no easy task. And and Benoit didn't make it easy for himself in round one. But that, I feel, was down to his own choice of just wanting to create a war. But Corner got in in round two, like I said. And he came out with a more kind of calm, cool, and collected approach in round two. And at that stage, Moises was kind of already beaten, as you said, based off what happened in round one. Yeah, I mean, I I generally thought the stoppage was a little bit late, um, maybe by five or six blows. And OK, they're not blows that are life changing. They're not blows that are direct to the skull or whatever, but... I think it was obvious by Moises's lack of movement, lack of ability to build height, lack of willingness to build height, and just the covering up that that we were done here. Um, but yeah, the the, the grappling exchanges were, were really really interesting because uh, Benoit Saint Denis had, I mean, obviously caused Thiago Santos so much damage in the first round and was so willing to trade damage. And I think that there was the level of it, it was just disconcerting from Moises because he hit him with so many massive shots that Bama Sentini just, just didn't even look like they phased him in the slightest. And that that has to be demoralizing for a fighter, right? Like you go in and you throw him, you hit him clean with literally your best shots, and your man doesn't blink. Yeah, that takes that takes so much confidence away from you. Like it's like, what am I going to have to do here? It's 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 an awful feeling, and it is. Uh, you know, I can imagine it's almost as awful at the highest level here. But you know, fair play to to Benoit. It was a real. Um, I think it was a real kind of coming of age moment for Benoit Saint Denis inside the UFC. Harry, you know, getting that rapturous applause, creating that exciting fight in France. Um, Lost his debut at welterweight to Alessio, uh, Alessio de San, uh, Alessio, I helped you out now, Harry. You're going to have to help me out. Alessio, Alessio Zaleski. Zaleski. Alessio Zaleski de Santos in, um, at welterweight. Since then, moved down to lightweight. He's picked up four or five wins in a row. Is it time for uh, ranked opponents now for Benoit de Santini? I have a crazy name. It's not going to happen, but just hear me out. Dustin Poirier wants to fight. Dustin Dusty, Poirier. Dusty P ain't going to fight down that far, man. I you know what I mean? So. I know yeah. I know it's a crazy ask, but just let me sell it to you. Forget rankings, forget whatever, forget positions. I think Dustin Poirier should at this point know he's never getting a title shot again. And if he does, he's not winning it, right? We're done with the, the Gaethje triangle. If he wants to finish off the Gaethje tri trilogy, fine, no bother. But you have 
an ability, a chance here. You want to do fun fights for your legacy, for your your way of bowing out to the sport. And what Saint Denis is that man? Like I think Justin Poirier's idea of fun fights now is for him to finish off as the Conor McGregor rematch is maybe a move up the welterweight. He ain't looking to go and fight these young and hungry lightweights anymore. But I I I respect and I see what you're doing, and other fighters would choose to do that. Look at uh, Justin Gaethje did it. He did it against Rafael Fasiv. So, I mean, stranger things have happened, Harry. I'm not willing to put a, a full bucket of cold water over that matchup. The other name, yes, is Jalen Turner. Yes, that's that's a le- that's a lot more feasible in, uh, for me. I think it's a good opportunity for him to kind of fight ranked opposition. I think he deserves that. Whether oh, yes. it be Dustin Poirier, whether it be Turner, no matter what, I think next for Bamwa Saint Denis is going to have to be a ranked opponent. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan. We've talked him up here. We've we I, I was kind of following following him. He came from Brave uh, CF and put on a couple of great performances there. And you know, maybe a lot of people threw the book out on him, uh, but he came in at a higher weight class, and the referee did him no justice in that uh, Alessio Zaleski fight. So I'm glad that he's rebounded. I'm I'm glad that he's re- recovered, and and it's fun to see him storming up the lightweight rankings. Um. It was also fun to see Volkan Ozdemir kind of turn back the clock a little bit here as well. And he said, I ain't going to be no damn gatekeeper here for Guzkov in this fight. Um, came out and produced a really good performance here. Um, you know, on paper, we've seen these a couple of times within the UFC, but it was just a little bit too much too soon for Bogdan Gustav here in the in the uh, like heavyweight division coming in against a, a former uh, UFC title uh, challenger in Falcon Ozdemir, who went on and surprised everybody to win by a rear naked choke in round three as well, showing that, you know, he does have some submission capabilities, having knocked out a lot of his previous opponents. But uh, I'm very curious to hear your overall thoughts on this fight, Harry. Yeah, I mean, no time rolled the clock back, right? And um, he did. the thing that I enjoyed here is usually when he gets into firefights now, in, in, in the last little stage of his career, he's looked timid when he takes a shot. But here, he looked hungry. He looked up for it. He looked happy to exchange because that was his game, right? He would close the distance. He's exchanging the pocket. He'd land massive shots. When he had you hurt, he'd just run you down and finish you, right? And I think the thing that, that I enjoyed here, the slight progression that I enjoyed in this fight, as we saw the old Volkan Ozdemir, where he drew Goskov into the pocket, he landed the bigger shots, he hurt Goskov, and then he measured his approach. He didn't go hell for leather and just gas himself out or whatever. He picked his shots nicely, and instead of forcing the TKO, he realized that Goskov wasn't protecting his neck from the turtle position, and just slid the choke in. Like, it wasn't, I wouldn't even say it it, it proves he has submission capabilities, because Goskov was done and finished out of there by the time. Yeah, yeah, a little bit loosey-goosey statement there from, I think from me the thing that i enjoyed about it though was just the cerebral level up it's the ability to say ah fuck i don't need to keep battering him here and catching shots on his glove or shots on his forearms or shots on his on it on it on his wrists i'll just finish him because he wants to be finished and that to me is the, is the most interesting thing for, for Volkan Ozdemir because as he's getting to the last stage of his career, both in age and, and actually in career numbers, we're looking at a guy that's making better decisions. And that's not something we often see as fighters get older. So fair play to Volkan Ozdemir. I coming in said I expected this to be just what we've seen previously in, in heavier divisions. And that's you bring in some young, hungry Eastern European fella and you put him in against a guy that is a, getting a little bit chinny and he gets whacked. And Volkan yeah. Ozdemir says, yeah, we're not doing that today, big it man. It seems to be the thing to do at uh, 185 and at 205 right now. Two struggling divisions uh, for, for overall talent. But... Uh, I mean, Bogdan Gustav, he he had some good spells in the fight, Harry. We wouldn't be throwing his chances of of winning a few fights in the UFC out the window altogether. Uh, Obviously comes in there with a big kind of power and, and a lot of finishes. But, you know, it was just too much too soon for him. And that was a very tough UFC debut. And we've seen it before and we'll see it again. Um, For Volkan Ozdemir next, Harry, what would you like to see? 
whatever. Like, Who cares? You know, is, is Ryan Spann still fighting in the UFC? Oh, Do that. God, don't mention that lad's name. Yeah, is yeah. Anthony Smith still fighting in the UFC? Do that. Like, whatever. Like, whatever. Yeah, put Bogdan Gustav versus Anthony Smith. Put both uh, both guys will just be pointing at each other, thinking that they're looking in the mirror. But how's it ever? We shall move on. Um, to uh, William Gomis versus Yanis Gamori. Uh, look, we spoke about Gamori, original opponent of Kale and Lochran, and seeing him at weigh ins, Harry, seeing him walking into the UFC octagon, it, uh, it bared no mystery that that why that man didn't take the Kale and Lochran fight because there was no damn way he was making 135 pounds. Uh, went in there, controversial f- uh, finish to the fight. In the third round, uh, William Gomez, after an over and uh, an over and back three rounds between uh, Gamori and Gomisa, one that Gam- I feel that Gomez was getting the better of. Um, it was the kick at the end of the fight that drew the most talk, that drew the most most kind of criticism here. Before we get to that, Harry, just maybe share your thoughts on how you saw the fight progressing before the finish. It was a bog standard William Gomez performance. It really was like he mixes up his ability to move in and out of the pocket as and when he chooses to. He fights so well on the outside. Like he's a point fighter by trade. You know, he really is. He he really came onto our radar when he beat Tobias Cirilla and Cage Warriors doing exactly the same thing. And just look great doing it. Like it's such a tricky style to try and deal with because you can't pressure them because their footwork's too good and they're, they're tracking that outside tram line. And as you're coming in, they have things to jam you. They have low kicks, they have side kicks. The William Gomez turning side kicks, a beautiful thing to watch. They have high kicks, they've got knees, they've got all sorts of weapons to, to dissuade somebody from closing the distance. And so if you can't close the distance, well, all you can do is fight them at their game and that's exactly what they want, right? So it's a really, really tough style to try and deal with. Um, especially and, on three days notice as well I mean you're never going to get a true outlay on how this fight would have went based off the, the small amount of prep time that both of these guys had well I mean I think this is the point right this is why I think the Gomi style is so effective because you had Yanis Gamori coming in on three days notice but you also had uh, William Gomis coming in on three days notice for sure. and, yeah. and that William Gomis style he didn't change anything he just no. went out and fought his fight like in the second yeah. round, I was impressed that he sort of came out of his shell a little bit and moved forward and really tried to land some blows on Gimori. Um, I wasn't all impressed with Gimori drastically. Like, again, please, let's see another fight. I, I want to see full camp. Let's see him get in there at 145 when he's not trying to kill himself to get 135. And let's see what he's made of. But for me, it was, I, I wrote, uh, you know, I, I never really write scorecards in my notes unless I'm super confident. And at the end of the second round, I put 2018 Gomis here, like without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and then in the third round, for me, uh, it's not a stoppage. Um, it was a low kick. It moved the yes. cup. And um, if it moves the cup, like, look, if you smack the inside of the leg so hard that the vibrations move the cup, sure, it's not a low kick. If the leg doesn't travel to the cup, it's not a low kick. But this one seemed like it grazed up through the cup and landed on the belt line. And to me, that's that's contact with the cup, and it's still a low kick. Um, I think Gamori is well within his rights to be aghast here at this loss. Um, and I hope that the UFC see that and and recognize that it was just a, a real strange call, not one that we see very often at the UFC level. The call was made by Locke Parra, a French um, a referee, Harry, who... Uh, Kaposa famously retweeted after this fight was a guy who stood somebody up from full mount position before to standing. So, I mean, the standard, not that great for a UFC event. And there was a couple of dodgy judging decisions uh, for, as well throughout, you know, which would be a little bit worrisome. But um, things like this, you really have to be getting right. You know, um, like you said, I kind of said it before the podcast. To me, if you move the cup with the contact, that's a low blow. And that's what happened. And I thought it was a pretty easy call that was messed up. Look, at Gamori was on the way to probably losing a decision any which way. But that doesn't matter. You need to be getting these decisions right. Because, you know, if you make them at that level, you know, there's a chance you make them at a higher level where there can be kind of more detrimental kind of outcomes. And you just don't want to see that. Um, William Gomez, for us, Harry, you know, a guy that we got a glimpse of in um cage warriors on his on his day is uh pretty damn good fighter pretty slick but you know 
This one was his third UFC win in a row. Um, not really, not really anything standout-ish about the performance, really. I think that's a fair thing to say. But uh, what would you like to see next for, for the Frenchman? The Last Pirate. Morgan Charity. Oh, you're trying to get all these French guys to take each other out. I like it. I like it. Woo-hoo, that is a that is a good fight. Yeah, that is a good fight. I love it. My, the reason my, my thoughts are this, right? Like all the Paul Hughes fight, obviously, but you know, whatever. We'll we'll stop the meme as soon as you get signed. But like the the Morgan Charrier fight, you are looking for somebody that can break down the style of Gomez. Well, Charrier has big power. He's willing to throw. He's willing to close the distance. He can grapple. And he has slick footwork and he has slick head movement. He's not a pro. He's, he doesn't have a problem taking a shot to give one. And so I think that's the type of style, both technically and from an aggressive perspective, that can give Gomez trouble. And so if he gets through Charrier, that's a massive feather in his cap from a stylistic perspective. If Charrier goes out and looks anything like he did against Manolo Zucchini, then he causes Gomez problems. And we get to see whether Gomez has a plan B or a plan C, or whether the plan A is going to be good enough. And so from a, a tactical perspective, I really, really like that fight. As do I. As do I. Which brings us to the last pirate uh, himself made his UFC debut, Morgan Charrier, as the main card opener, took on Italy's Manolo Zacchini. And this was a pretty big mismatch, in my opinion. Uh, the finish itself, you know, Sharia, the writing was on the wall for quite some time. Uh, Sharia had uh, Zacchini kind of backing up under the pressure and under the strikes. The body work was fantastic. A teep to the to the solar plexus kind of uh, dropped down the Zacchini to his knee. And then it was followed up with a run and kick to the body, which was absolutely vicious and brutal. And a good performance for Sharia. Uh, m- Sharia was matched like a potential superstar inside the UFC. I think that's the way the UFC view him. And rightly so, he's got such a massive following. But, uh, you know, he's going to be in there with tougher guys. But he disposed of Zucchini as you would expect him to do so. Wouldn't you? Would you agree, Harry? Yeah, I mean, the team to the, the, the solar plexus was set up by one body kick before that. And it was a left body kick that he caught him on the angle. And as soon as it hit, you could you, Zucchini couldn't stop but to wince. And the thing that was, again, and we've seen this time and time again in Cage Warriors, but the thing that's impressive about Morgan Charrier is he knew, he watched, he saw the grimace, he knew that he had his man hurt, but his facial expression didn't change. And he just sauntered on, carried on landing his strikes, but he, he'd, he'd logged it, right? He's like, oh, this guy's hurt now. Okay, well, you know, I've got time, right? I've still got 10 minutes if I need them. Right? There's no problem. He's hurt. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay the pressure. I'm going to do what I need to do. And he found the teep, drops him, gets up. And obviously the finish is absolutely savage, right? That's absolutely savage. Like just a, a beautiful display of accuracy, of fight IQ, of timing of the whole thing, because he waited just as his hands and knees raised up. So he was a standing fighter eligible to be kicked and he just slams a shot into him. And yeah, savage. Don't that enough, don't we not? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Like this is a like that's the sort of thing. You remember, even knees to a grounded opponent is is fine it's to the body, right? Knees to a grounded opponent, kicks to the a grounded opponent to the body, fine. So for Charrier to to one have the understanding of the rule set to be able to think and throw the shot, but to time it, to land it in the way that he did, to 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 angle it and and send it the way he did was absolutely fantastic. But I think to your point about the superstar thing and the matching and whatever. Sharia doesn't have long left. Like he's like 32, 33 now. The UFC need to squeeze that juice as much as they possibly can. And that this is the way you do it, right? You chuck him at the start of a French French card. Uh, he was the first fight on the main card. Fans are going absolutely fucking bananas for him. And he absolutely folds a fella in half. Like this is exactly the type of thing that the UFC want to do. Exactly the type of thing. Absolutely, and uh, and they know they have a star in their hands. But yeah, it's off to the races. Time is not on Morgan Charrier's side. It'll be interesting. We said go meet next. We won't talk too much about what's next for Charrier. Let's talk about Taylor Lapalus versus Kalen Lochran. Um, fight came together during fight week. A very, very difficult task for Kalen Lochran. I just want to say before we talk about the fight, um, a lot of, you know, K- K- Kalen approached this week um, 
you know, and was very vocal and out there and, and created, like you said at the start of this podcast, he created a very big fight here between him and Laplace the way he did. And, um, you know, some people don't like to chit chat and everything like that, but, you know, we're in the entertainment business and we're in the fight business. And, you know, when you get opportunities like this, you have to make them count. And, and Kalen did that. And, you know, people are wanting to kind of take him down after this because of that, where, in the same breath, if he had got the win, they would have been kind of probably hoisting them up on this pedestal. So, like, MMA is such a cruel, cruel sport in that when you put yourself out there like Caelan Lochran did, um, you know, you're going to get the criticism, and he expects the criticism. But, you know, people who are calling him finished and no good and he's never going to get a win need to realise the full uh, idea of this situation that he was put into this week because he got absolutely the raw end of the stick in all of this. He had signed a contract to fight Yanis Gamori, who five days before the fight refused to make weight, um, then get hoist, gets hoisted in against Taylor Laplace, a two-time UFC um, fighter now at this stage, coming back for his second stint, a very well-rounded fighter, a fighter that has 22 professional mixed martial arts fights with Takeel and Loughran's, um nine now and Caelan Nochran didn't do too bad if you really look at it and you really know what you're looking at he didn't do too bad here for a guy coming in with a very very big task ahead of him um and look at he'll learn a lot coming through this and um you know there are some holes in these games that he will have to fill up like he's going to know this and um I'm excited for the future and so, so should everybody else I mean I do not get I can get it from I can get it from maybe the US crowd and stuff like that, but I don't get it from some of the Irish crowd that are wanting to bring Caelan Lochran down or bring Reese McKee down that we'll talk about in a few minutes. We should be bigging these guys up as much as we can as fans. Obviously, as media members, we have to talk about what happens in these fights, but, um, you know, that's just the nature of the beast that we're in, I guess. But let's talk about the fight. We'll talk about what's next after the fight, Harry. Um Taylor Laplace's job in this fight was 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 the defining uh, the defining kind of winning of this fight for me, and he did his homework because he looked back at that Dylan Hazan fight. I spoke to Kaelin Lochran ahead of this fight, you know, about um, that Dylan Hazan fight, and Hazan was successful uh, for a brief moment in time with the jab. Obviously, a guy like Taylor Laplace's jab uh, much more defined, much more schooled, and and very uh, accurate as well. Um, and it caused Caelan Nochran massive problems here. It, it, it caused them difficulties in kind of closing the distance to initially initiate grappling. Um, he couldn't get on the inside to kind of get off some of his strikes. You know, we're talking about a guy who had three, four days to kind of get through these conundrums, and that's a very difficult task to do with a guy as good as Taylor Lapolis. Harry, um, uh, curious to see what you thought of this fight and how it played out. You summed it up perfectly. Like Shawnee, I think, made a statement either publicly or, or in or on the podcast. I can't remember. And he said, "Taylor and Taylor, uh, Kellen Lockman shouldn't be happy. This, this is not a fight he should be fighting. Right? This early in his career, the level of Taylor Lapolis, this isn't a guy that that uh, an eight and zero guy should be fighting. And and, yeah. and I agree. And I think it was evident. Right? Kellen is so used to pulling the jab from fighters and ducking inside, using that far fade away to his left-hand side shoulder and coming in and finding the inside space and landing shots there, right? He is so used to doing that throughout his cage warrior's career. He's been able to do that throughout his amateur career. He's been able to do that. And you can tell that it's now an intrinsic part of his game. Thankfully, we have found out early enough for Kaelin Lockwood in his professional MMA career that that shit doesn't wash at the higher levels. It just doesn't wash. Or at least if it does wash, you have to have something to set that stuff up. And Taylor exactly. Lapis just peppered him with the jab the entire fight. Now, Taylor, it's down to, I would look at the experience between the two, right? So what you're dealing with is both guys. I'm not going to try and put, put Kaelin on the pedestal here and say, no, he had to deal with a three or four day notice of this fight. So did Taylor Lapolis. But the difference is when you're a 22 fight veteran in comparison to an under 10 fight veteran you know you will have gained that experience and how to adapt to different situations as the fight goes on we talk about high level mixed martial arts at the very top harry but you know we could even bracket that into the ufc and in that you know it is a different kettle of fish than when you're going into 
a Cage Warriors or an LFA or, or one of these regional shows where, you know, what got, gets you to the dance not might not necessarily keep you in the dance. And I think the ability to be able to change up some game plans or change up some strategies mid-fight is something that does come with experience. It's something that Kalen will probably learn and take from this fight as well and that we may see in future fights. But, you know, I think all of those circumstances, it's vital to take that into kind of the the outcome of this fight. And what wasn't a blowaway fight either. It was a relatively close fight throughout. And I think Graham even said it in the group that, you know, and I, I can't, I couldn't disagree with him. Up until the last, and Kalen is not going to want to hear this at all, but up until almost the last 30 seconds of this fight, it was anybody's. I think it was the final shots in at the end of the third round that, you know, that really kind of cemented the third round for Taylor Lapolis. And, you know, it, it was a good effort from Lapolis too. A lot of pressure on his shoulders considering all the shit that Kalen had talked about French MMA and him as well. It was up to him to kind of deliver on the night and he did just that. Yeah, I think for me, the first round was the toughest round of Kalen Lochran's US, uh, MMA career. And that's not because he took a vast amount of damage. It's not because he was rocked, dropped, had to come back, do any of this stuff. He just realized that his skill set isn't broad enough. And that is a really tough challenge to come in against. Because Taylor Lapolis destroyed him in that first round technically and tactically with one shot. Right Now... The thing that Kalen did in the first round that I was really impressed with is he was like, oh, okay, I can't get past the jab. I can't get past the jab to land my shots. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take further steps out and I'm just going to drive my face into his chest and try and level change. He can't jab me from there. And then he has to defend my takedowns. And I was very, very impressed at his will to win, right? It's not beautiful. It's not the most technical approach. It's not the correct technical approach you teach your fighter on how to deal with a jab. But it was fucking good. Like, it was effective. It, it, it is. If it's effective, it means and uh, that that's what you're looking for. You know, you don't have to... Like, sometimes you criticize fighters winning ugly. It was better to win ugly than to not win at all. And uh, that's what Galen did. And he was looking to try and close the distance, like you said, and throw uh, and put the head into the chest of Laplace, looking for that inside-outside trips, um, you know, ones that he has had been successful with. And, you know, that's the difficulties of fighting short. Uh, notice opponents too is where you cannot really decipher too hard some of the weaknesses because you know there's many different ways you can take down a fight and you're always trying to target the uh the way that you feel would be the best obviously Kalen decided that was it, it wasn't effective early but he didn't give up and it was effective in round two it was effective in round three as well i guess you know on top of the takedowns and the control, you probably want and need to see a little bit more damage when you're on top from Kalen Lochran to really seal the deal. But that being said, it was round one for Laplace. It was round two for Kalen Lochran based off the effectiveness of his grappling. And round three was a super close fight on the feet. Um, you know, we could finally see, you know, Laplace was kind of being drained a little bit through all of the, the, the takedown defense uh, work that he had to do throughout the fight. But uh, he remained cool, calm, and composed. The fight got back to the feet. And like I said, it was that final sequence when they traded off. He landed a huge one, too. Landed a big left hook or right hook, I believe, as well. And, you know, that was enough for me. And I'm sure it was enough for the judges as well to score the fight. One judge, I believe, had this at 30-27, which is outrageous, um, in my opinion. I thought the, the score for me was a 29-28 to Lapalus. And uh, I think two of the three judges did get it right, so credit to them. And, um, yeah, any final thoughts on this uh, with Kalen and, or with Lapalus? What would you like to kind of see next for both of these gentlemen? Lapalus, I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't want to do this just because this is the card, but I like matching fighters on timelines. And I'm kind of interested in Farid Far Far Bashevat versus Taylor Lapalus. Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. Mostly yes, because, like, like if uh, Farid Basharat is a very patient fighter, but is a very intelligent fighter. And... I think that if there's going to be somebody that's going to uh, mix the grappling damage with the submission offense, it's, Jared, it's, it's Farid Basharat. Like We've just seen it in his performance earlier in the card. Very different fighter to Kalen Locker and a very different uh, skill set to prepare for in Taylor Lapalus, obviously. But if he goes out and beats Taylor Lapalus, then it's a ranked opponent next. 
right? And that's that's a tough thing to ask for in a 135 pound division. I think for Kalen Lochran, I wouldn't even mind seeing him fight Clayton Rodriguez, like yeah. a guy big that will take a shot, will land a shot, but equally was out grappled. And for Kalen Lochran, I think he wants to go in and land hands. He wants to go in and drop bombs, and that's fine. But the grappling in his back pocket, and I just want to tag on to the two things that you said there. The second round for me was was definitely a Kalen Lockran round. His ability to drag the fight to the mat and immediately lock up the the, the Dagestani triangle over the knees of Taylor Lapalus just gives him so much control, and he had so much time. Now he couldn't get to the wrist configurations he wanted. He desperately wanted a Dagestani handcuff with his right hand on the on the right hand of, of Taylor Lapalus, but he couldn't get it. And that's fine; these things happen in MMA. But I think he did absolutely more than enough in that second round. To he did land damage on the ground. He did control the position. Yes, I would have liked to have seen more damage. I'd have liked to have seen far more impactful striking on the ground. Or at least really try and search for his back. And when you get to his back, really, really be looking for those submissions and looking for damage. And he didn't do that. And that's fine. But I, I certainly didn't score the, the second round to Taylor Lapalus. And I agree that the third round was absolutely a swing round until those 25 seconds. I did not know which way I was scoring that third round until the last 25 seconds. And Kalen let it, let it slip away. And that's the inexperience, right? Nine fights into your professional MMA career. These things are going to happen. I think I'm more excited for... Kalen's next bout for sure it, it should be just with a like what I would like to see him just match with a similarly experienced opponent here like the Gamori fight was was a good one for him similar enough experience you know I seen John Kavna was tweeting out that he wants to see him fight Brad Katona I don't want I like that fight but not at this stage of Kalen Lachlan's career we've got to allow this guy to develop into the fighter that he's going to become and you're not going to go in there by throwing him in there with chiseled uh, veterans um, with lots of experience at this stage now is not the time and uh, hopefully they do well it be December like Caelan was uh, looking at beforehand that time will tell but uh, almost certainly we're going to see him perform in, in UFC Dublin if it happens next year and uh, I'm I'm excited to see it um, as well I'm looking forward to seeing Caelan coming back and you know he owned it his uh, owned it his defeat he, he owned it all the shit talk and, and that's all you can do like I said in, in, in this kind of in this kind of playing field and uh yeah we uh will look forward to Kalen Lochran's next fight which moves us on to uh Reese McKee who opened up the Irish action on the uh, French card when he went on and took uh, on Angie Lusa um a really battling battling performance from Reese McKee and you know in in I I try my best to kind of put myself into other people's shoes um, you know, when I'm trying to kind of decipher how a fight went down, Harry, and I'm um, kind of what I took away from this is that you know, there was a lot on the line for Reese McKee and a lot of chat coming into this fight about this being his second chance, and hopefully, it goes better than the first UFC stint. And um, he didn't go out there and perform to the levels that we've seen him perform in the past. And I think when you're a little bit nervous about not going wrong, what what Reese McKee didn't want to happen at the start of this fight was to be caught by a big right hand and or a big overhand shot by Lusa. And that's exactly what happened. And he got hurt and it took him a little bit of time to kind of bounce back from that. And it was just a very unlucky and a bad start for him. And one that probably took away a little bit of confidence too. Um, but, you know, he did show the mental capacity to fight his way back into the fight after a, a pretty disastrous first round, really, um, where he did take that big shot. And, you know, he, even later on in the first round, he did battle into it as well, and, and the same in round two. But, um, you know, it wasn't enough in the end. He almost got Lusa out of there towards the end of round three. And, you know, it's, I guess, to, you know, you visualize certain things in your head, Harry, and he, Reese McKee definitely didn't visualize going out there and, and almost, like, getting really badly hurt on his feet in, in, in one of the early exchanges. And that's a big mental kind of hurdle that you have to get over on top of everything else in this fight. Um, no questioning Reese McKee's heart in this, uh, no questioning his gas tank, but you know, you're going to need a little bit more than that, unfortunately. And Reese will know this as well to, to kind of continue your UFC career. And it'll be very, very disappointing for him. There's nobody that deserves this, uh, in my opinion, than Reese McKee, uh, a veteran of Irish mixed martial arts, a guy that's been around for such a long time. And it was unfortunate he didn't get the job done, but he, uh, he said he'll be back. I'm confident he'll be back. And, um, what kind of 
what kind of takeaways did you take from from this encounter with Angie Lusa? And you, you know, Lusa came in and was was good in this fight too. Moved forward, uh, very aggressive, was quick on the feet, you know, and kind of that probably kind of surprised Reese McKee a little bit, especially in the early stages of the fight. It's just not good enough. Like we have seen the level. We've seen the level in other fights. It is absolutely not good enough for Reese McKee to come out and start as slowly as he did in round one. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, he spoke so affluently to Shawnee about what he saw from Andre Lusa. He knew what he was going in against. And we know, we talked about it on the preview show, when Reese McKee gets in the flow of his jab, piston jab, thudding jab, big right hand, stomping right hand down the pipe. He looks fantastic. He looks absolutely fantastic. But in the opening three minutes, he looked sluggish. He looked slow. Obviously, he took a ton of damage. I would have had no problem with them stopping the fight in round two. He took a hellacious beating against the fence for six seconds or so with his just face wobbling all over the place. Now, we know because we've watched his career that when the tough gets going, Reese McKee's going to keep coming forward and he's you absolutely have to separate him from his consciousness in order for him to stop doing that. And the body work started to add up. But Andre Lusa had also just kind of punched himself out at that point. And that's not a credit to Reese McKee. Yes, we have to say that his toughness is unbelievable and absolutely insane trait. But the way that he uses his toughness is not the same as Benoit said than he uses his, right? Benoit said then he uses his toughness to, to break people. Reese McKee in this fight used it to stay in the fight and have what was an incredible moment in the third round. Like I wrote it in my I notes. I said, are we going to have a Cottle Pendred here? Like, is that what we're looking at here? Because that's what like it was almost. And I think even Reese at that stage of the fight, if he had a, had a little bit more gas in the tank, he would have got, got loose out of there for sure. Oh. In my opinion, it was really, really close. But ultimately, like I said, Reese knows the, the levels that you have to bring if you want to compete and challenge. And, and I think it's very fair to say that those levels were not there on Saturday night. Whatever is happening, whatever is going on, is it a mental kind of hurdle? You know, is it getting clipped and having the fight not go your way early in the fight? You know, that's all those are questions that Reese will, and only Reese will be able to answer. We can only speculate about it, but you know, the pressure is on now uh, at this stage, and, and this is the reality of the situation. You're zero and three inside the UFC, and every fight is a big fight. And you know, he's going to go in and he definitely deserves to get another crack. Another, uh, I'd love to see him get another crack in Dublin and see what happens from there, but um. You know, the pressure will stay increasing until he gets that win in the octagon. And it'll be very interesting to see if he can kind of overcome those hurdles and, and, and get the job done. Um, any other thoughts on this one, Harry? I don't know what it is either. But... Yeah, it's so it's I, I you know, it, it's. I, I didn't get the chance to speak with Reese before the fight. Andy got to speak with him and he spoke very well and, and knew everything like and. Whatever about the Hamzat Shemaev fight, and everybody wanted to concentrate on the Hamzat Shemaev fight, um, kind of talking to him, but it was also the Alex Morono fight where he underperformed in that one as well. And, you know, you're coming in here with the pressure of trying to not let that happen again. And, you know, he definitely underperformed in there against Angel Lusa as well. So it's, it's a thing where, you know, you're going to have to try and figure out what it is. Is it, uh, is it the nerves? Is it, a little bit of octagon jitters i'm not too sure like i said reese will be the only person who can answer those questions but one thing we do know and we can be confident is that you know reese can definitely produce a better performance than than what he showed on saturday night um be very interesting to see how the ufc will match him up next um with lusa he's coming back he was a a year off you know the freshness maybe um of Lusa from having that year off was uh, was a factor there. We had Reese McKee who had been in there with a war with Justin Burlinson and and you know he had been in there and and where he won the title as well and, and defended it in Cage Warriors a couple of times. You know, there was a lot of activity. Lusa kind of looked a lot more fresher in there until he got tired towards the end of the fight. But uh you know, it'd be interesting to hear uh, Reese's uh, thoughts whenever he does decide to kind of speak on 
I'll, maybe I'll reach out in a little while and, and see if he's interested in coming on and having a chat as I, as I will with Cale. And if, if they're both up for it, I gladly sit down and have the chat with them. But, uh, you know, let to take off the media huh? here. Reese is just a real stand up guy. You want to see him do well. He deserves it. And it's just unfortunate it didn't happen, but look at, he showed his battling spirit inside there in the octagon. He's going to have to do the same outside it, dust himself off, get himself ready because there's a big ass fight waiting for him at UFC Dublin next year. And it'll be interesting to see who it will be against and how he handles it. Um, is there anybody that would stand out to you, Harry, and who you'd like either Reese or maybe Lusa to fight next or, or shall we move on? Uh, Lusa, give me Mike Malott. And uh, for Reese. I mean, I, it could be horrendous, but Matt Brown. You want to get him a win in the UFC? Matt Brown? Good fight. I like that. I like that. I love it. As do I love the fact that Farid Bashrat was a part of the severe spotlight this week, Harry. I'm not going to wax lyrical about this. I'm going to send it straight over to you, good sir, to explain why. Sure. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here just because I think that the article I put out this week is probably the most detailed article I've put out on Severe MMA. Um, I, it was just one of those performances that, that just captured my soul a little because Farid just did everything so, so beautifully well and it needed to be written about. It needed to be spoken about. And so the thing that impressed me the most is he made it a mixed martial arts fight inside 15 seconds and he was willing to make it a mixed martial arts fight the entire time. The awareness of when to land damage, when was smart to land damage, when was to look for submission offense, when was to look for positional dominance was just absolutely fantastic. He he melted through Cledson Rodriguez's guard multiple times, was unlucky that Cledson Rodriguez had a fantastic reaction just as the, the head and arm choke was about to be set in the first in 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 the first round, but um uh, sorry in, in, in the first exchange, but in the second exchange, just made absolutely no mistake whatsoever. Forced Cledson Rodriguez to make mistake after mistake after mistake and just locked up what was an absolutely savage head and arm choke. Like really, really, really good performance from Farid Basharat. Just I I have questions about the stand-up. I have questions about his ability to to take a shot. And that's not to say you can't. It's just to say I haven't yeah, seen you're, it. You're going to have those questions at 11 and all as well, Harry, and to be fair, uh, to Farid as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I I think that your article definitely encapsulated his performance very well. And definitely head over to severemma.com and check that out each and every Monday. Harry will do that. Is this the second time Farid was, has been it, or was that that's the second time? Um, that he's been there and deservedly so. It was a, a good win. Um, you know, I uh, I was impressed by it, but yeah, there always is going to be questions. And you matched up Basharat with someone earlier on. Was it Taylor Lapalus? It was Taylor Lapalus. It wouldn't yeah. be a bad one. It wouldn't be a bad one to see uh, how you do in that situation. But uh, I want to ex- see a striker, like a significantly uh, a polished striker. A guy that can st- defend a takedown for a period of time as well, so that you can have, you know, you want to be left with the option of Far Bashra. Oh, like similar enough to what we've seen with Caelan Lockwood, is that sometimes when, you know, what you're trying to do is not working, you've got to think of a, a plan B or try to find another way. And it seems that Far Bashra, he has his way, he does his thing, and no one has been able to stop it yet. He's super dominant on the ground. And it'll be exciting to see what's next for him. I purposely skipped over Nora Cornhole. As I, do you know, I, I whenever I uh, think of that, I always think of uh, the Beavis and Butthead uh, kind of skit that they did. But uh, yeah, she picked up a win over Jocelyn Edwards. Uh, Jacqueline Cavalcanti picked up a win over Zara Farin, which in what Zara Farin's performance in that was probably one of the worst that I've ever seen inside of UFC Octagon. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? You're you have a rapturous French audience that are coming in to 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 see good fights, and they're singing and they're dancing and they're roaring at the start of this, and then this fight happens, and Zara Farin is just absolutely terrible, and it took all the buzz out of the crowd, and absolutely awful. I'm 
do you have any do you have any uh kind of uh, opinions on either one of these fights uh, in the 135 pound division for Carnole and 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 Edwards and um Farin and Cavalcanti of course was at a 140 catch weight so for for fan I just an absolutely disaster of a UFC his UFC career gets finished in in round 1 against Felicia Spencer and Megan Anderson she uh misses weight and has a cancelled bout against Josian Nunes. They try and make a Jocelyn Edwards fight. She withdraws just before. They then try and make an Alin Perez fight. She has medical issues during the weight cut, pulls out. Josian Nunes, she then gets absolutely blasted by. Try and make a Haley Cowan fight. Okay, fair play, Cowan is injured. And then she comes in against here against Cavalcanti, who, you know, Cavalcanti is, is, is raw in her career, right? Not many fights, only seven fights, and looks like she can do a bit of the fighting. Still so much time ahead and so much to to look for there but but fine but Connolly and Edwards was just trash like Connolly has a bit of upside she turns well in the corner she can strike a little bit but it's just not 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 good level MMA it's just not like it's really not yeah so like what did Bisbee call her one of the best you uh kickboxers coming out of France and I'm like uh Cedric Dume would like uh, a word please Mr Bisbee who had an absolutely horrendous night on Saturday night that being said but uh that's it. That takes us through the entire UFC Paris card. Like I said, a memorable night for French mixed martial arts. Not to be for Reese McKee and for Kaelin Lochran, but fate sure they will be back in action again. Thank you all for listening. Um, we'll be back with a preview show for the next UFC installment, which is UFC 293, Israel Adesanya, Sean Strickland, later on this week. Head on over. Follow Harry Powell at BJJ underscore Harry Powell on all social media at IONeal MMA is where you'll catch me. We'll see you the next time.